If you all don't mind, the sheikh has just arrived, and so I would ask him if he's hungry to go to the head of the line, if that's possible. Elon, I'm well, thank you.
All right, my friends. I think it's about time, in the interests of keeping this all、uh, respectful of your time, that we begin. So I'd like to welcome you all to this second session of our interfaith lunch and learn series. We're going to do some myth busting about the three faiths that we share: Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. First of all, I'd like to introduce our esteemed God Squad. Sheikh Shafayet is still eating lunch, but he is here、uh, from the Al Hikmat Wisdom Center in Pembroke Pines, and it's a long way to come. So thank you so much for making that effort. As you know, Rabbi Matthew Durbin from Temple Beit Hayam here in Stewart. Yay. And our own Father Christian Anderson, soon to go on sabbatical. <laughs> Going to miss him like crazy. So, a word about our format. Our hope is that for our final session next week, May first, we can devote our time to your questions and the God Squad's answers. For that, I need you to email your. Questions to me, and that's my email address up there on the screen. Or you can write them out today and hand them to me. But I'd really like to give the God Squad a chance to think about your questions, so that they can come up with their most thoughtful and considered responses. So it's up to you to get questions to me. And if you fail to do that, we'll just have a really nice time over lunch and go home early. <laughs> But I'd much rather have. Some dialogue. So today's myth that we're going to bust, or not, is that religion, specifically the Abrahamic faiths, have been the cause of more violence and war than any other single factor. True or false, myth or reality. What do scriptures say about violence and war? Well, the vast majority of the scriptures of all three faiths encourage reverence of God, righteousness, compassion, humility, love, and peace. Just a few examples from Micah, chapter six, verse eight: "He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God." From Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is asked, "Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law?" And Jesus replied, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it: love your neighbor as yourself." All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And being a Jew, good Jew, he was quoting directly from the Book of Leviticus. The very word Islam shares the same root as salam or shalom, which means peace. Many verses in the Quran call for peaceful coexistence, and if war is to be fought, it should be from a posture of self-defense, not as the aggressor. However, Muhammad, in addition to being a prophet, Was a military man. He was a soldier, and spent years engaged in war. In a moment, Sheikh Shafiat can speak to whether Islam truly preaches peace, and how Muslims reconcile the wars that Muhammad waged with the peace he is supposed to have promoted. We human beings are sometimes conflicted creatures. On the one hand, we yearn for the transcendent. As Saint Augustine put it, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. God, as Ecclesiastes said, has placed eternity in our hearts. When we rest in God and abide in His time, in His eternity, we know the true meaning of shalom. But we're also driven by an instinct for survival. When people are threatened by oppression, poverty, Deprivation, deprivation of land and natural resources, when they are humiliated or exploited, we human beings have been known to take God into our own hands, so to speak. 
to invoke his name in order to justify whatever violent action we feel compelled to take in order to survive. Is religion the precipitating cause of violence in that case? I would say no. It's the injury or threat or de desperate circumstances that we're experiencing that provokes the violent response, born of the instinct to survive. And frequently we justify that by saying we felt God compelled us to take that action. When we say that we're fighting at God's behest, then the people we attack must be the so-called enemies of God. And that kind of scenario, which has been played out again and again over the course of history, people can convince themselves that they're engaged in an existential battle between good and evil, which they must win. Some of the language used in today's divisive political climate deliberately takes on this apocalyptic tone in order to stir up fear, as if the current election cycle is the final battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. Now, it is a serious election, but it's not the apocalypse. Do remember to vote. All that being said, it's true that both the Hebrew scriptures and the Muslim scriptures do contain passages that condone war and violence. In the Christian scriptures, you would be hard pressed to find Jesus advocating any form of violence. And yet, early on, the church fathers began to develop arguments that would justify war in certain circumstances. So let's turn to our panel of experts to shed some light on this thorny subject. Sheikh Shafaya. There is a concept in Islam called jihad, which in the popular mind is equated with holy war. When people hear the word, they think of jihadism, the mujahideen, Islamic jihad. Can you clarify exactly what jihad is? Are there different types of jihad? And were the con conquests of Muhammad driven by jihad? A lot of questions, I know. Yeah, I know. Just take them one at a time. <laughs> so once more, um, it's a pleasure to really be here again. Thank you all very much. I do enjoy the drive two hours from Miami. <laughs> <laughs> That's, by the time I reach here, I'm hungry. Um, and I can't resist the salad. I love it here. So I have to just take a Great. bite, so bear with me. Uh, and that makes me feel at home. So it's a pleasure to be here again. I really do enjoy this. I would tell him my friend, student coming up with me that I learn a lot. I learn really from the rabbi and the, the, um, the father. And I do admire Dashi for the kind of research you do. I mean, you're phenomenal. You're wonderful. Thank you. You should be preaching from the pulpit, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man. <laughs> I, I'm really amazed that you do a lot of homework. Um, I yeah, look dumb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm you're, kidding. you're fantastic. <laughs> So basically, you know, I mean, I know you hear a lot in the media and you hear a lot and, uh, you know, you read a lot online, but jihad is really a word that means to struggle. It means to strive. So I got, I got to share that with you because you'd probably be hearing a different perspective. It means to strive. So uh, a, a mother can tell a son you need to study. It's a big jihad in your life to become a doctor. Mm. That's where the word is really used, a struggle, a strive. So based on your question, people have used that word to mean holy war, fights, and wars. So one is what the word really means and what, is, what, it, what it is used for. And um, based on what you hear and you see all around. Islam, while, the, while you said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was a military man, yes, he was. But Islam teaches us not to offend anyone. If you go back in the history of all the wars, I'm not saying there were no wars. Yes, there were wars. But in all the wars, it was about defense. Muslims are not permitted to offend anyone. Actually, if someone offends you, 
you are recommended to forgive them. But it also gave you the prerogative and the right to defend yourself. You, you see the point? So one is you got the first choice that you can forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. And we believe by forgiving, God forgives you also. Because if you want God to forgive you, you have to learn to forgive human beings. So that is one point. In the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, yes. When Remember he was in a place in Makkah preaching about God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of David, the God of Solomon. And these people worshipped idols. They worshipped idols. And they wanted to kill him. As they did with Abraham. Remember they threw Abraham in the fire. Because Abraham or Abraham was against idol worship. And they tried to kill him because they did not want him to preach this oneness of God. And hence, ever since those days, you go back into the, the Torah and the Bible, you see even when Jesus started preaching the righteous things and telling people what is wrong and what is right, they wanted to kill him. Uh, when they Moses, succeeded, actually. <laughs> yes, and according to Christian belief, they crucified him. Why? Because he was a good man preaching the right thing, and those who were on the wrong path had to get rid of him. When Moses wanted to preach the message, and he was pre preaching the message, what did Pharaoh do? Most of you would have seen the Ten Commandments. What did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh tried to kill him and the Israelites until God opened the ocean for him to walk across with the Israelites. But... Moses and Jesus, peace be upon him, they had a different style, and in those days it was a different approach. In Islam, you have the style to either leave, and that the prophet, peace be upon him, did, if you study the history, when he was in Makkah first, and they wanted to kill him, he left. He didn't fight anyone. He didn't do anyone anything. So you got to check that out. That's the history. That's how he left Makkah and went to Medina. As Moses left with the Israelites and crossed the Red Sea and came back to the Holy Land. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did that. And I have to clarify this because I know, yes, you have a lot of radicals and extremists in Islam. You have all these uh, extremists all over the world and all these groups. They, they're on their own agenda. They're on their own world. But, I mean, based on the question that you asked me, I have to clarify this because it's more on the Muslim world that you have all this radicalism in the, on the news that you see. So that he did. He left Makkah. He migrated and went to Medina, even though they wanted to kill him. He had to hide in the mountains and disappear to go to Medina. And when he went to Medina, that's where he started getting more support and people helping him and assisting him and working with him. Actually, his supporters and helpers when he went to Makkah or Medina were the Jews and Christians. There were no Muslims there. There were Jews and Christians who were his helpers, his friends, his companions. <coughs> when he developed strength and had people and power, and then like now the people from Makkah wanted to get rid of him there. He migrated. He left in peace. When they wanted to get rid of him there and they tried to attack him and kill him and his people, that's in defense when he did the war. So that's where the war is permissible to defend yourself. And I always tell people, it's like America's army. If someone comes to attack, um, attack America, do you go to sleep? One of the conditions in America, being in the army and the rights of being in the army, etc., someone attacks your country, you have the rights of defense. You're a police officer, you, someone attacks you, you got the right, that's your job. So from a security point of view, defense is very authentic. So Islam allows defense. But, but I, 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 I have to say, I yeah. have to interrupt you here just to ask, the whole time that Muhammad was fighting, he wasn't going backwards. I mean, he conquered an, a whole lot of territory and that wasn't all in defense, was it? Oh, no, all those things happened later on. Oh, in the early days, this was about defense. Later on, when the population started growing and the, 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 the Muslims uh, started growing in great numbers, then what happened? You had people who also was attacking them, 
because of their popularity and their growth. So you're so saying it was still of defensive. Of course, in defense, in defense, he had to defend himself and his people. But when defending, they ended up conquering. Because if a country and a tribe and a nation tries to attack you and you defend and, and you, you win, win over, I see. then you overpower. So, but he never went to take any land as though it was about fighting for land and power and nationality. It was not about that. But unfortunately, and I'll conclude uh, now, what you see happen with things like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all these things, they don't represent Islam. That's why I had to give you that, that brief thing of what the Prophet, peace be upon him, did. Now, they believe, because they have their own belief and their own territory and their own political agenda, if people attack them, now they claim to say, in the name of God, we fight. But it's not in the name of God. It's the name of power and the name of... of, of um, they wanting to hold their own territory, whether it be the Taliban in Afghanistan, whether it be places in Iraq. They want their own power, so they fight. But what do they do? They say in the name of God. But that's not justified. And my last evidence of that, that's why the majority, they are, they are a very minor, minority people. The majority of the Muslim world do not support and do not promote what people like ISIS or Al-Qaeda do. And you know that. You could go check that out. And so the I media can... certainly don't want you to just be thinking about all the peaceful Muslims in the world. They want you, you to be thinking about the violence, the bloodshed, because that's what gets eyeballs on screens. And of so course, on. if you go on and you tune on the television in the evening to look at the news, this might be a beautiful sport. It might be a beautiful Jensen Beach. It might be a beautiful Miami on the waters. One guy shoots someone, and that's headline news. So you think everyone in Miami a bunch of murderers. That's what the media, that's their job, and that's how they operate. They got a job to do, but they don't tell you of all the peaceful things that happen. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Now I'm going to put Rabbi on the spot. <laughs> heavy sigh, heavy sigh. People usually cite the book of Joshua as evidence that the Israelites were occasionally instructed by God to commit acts of extreme violence and destruction. During Israel's conquest of Canaan in the book of Joshua, for example, God tells his people that the Canaanites and all that they possess are harem, that is to say completely given over to God and are to be utterly destroyed. Rabbi, can you shed more light on this practice and how widespread it was? Thank you. <laughs> Happy it's the Passover. one question that I feared. <laughs> However, I, I think we need to go back uh, a little bit with, with um, a little bit of general understanding. Uh, one is, uh, much like Sheikh, like you, you, you described in terms of the terminology of what Islam means. You know, same thing with, with Judaism. Israel, Israel, is about one who struggles with God, right? We remember, for those that may remember the story with Jacob, struggling with the angel and of course he overpowers and the angel says okay your name shall no longer be jacob but it shall be israel in the beginning of genesis you hear of three prophetic ideals that are revealed by god one is that through isaac that you and your descendants shall be blessed we hear the same a chapter earlier with Hagar and Ishmael. For of course God says to Hagar, do not turn your back on your son, for I will make him a mighty nation. Look at the numbers. We're slightly skewed a little bit. Islam, <laughs> a billion. Judaism, 16 million. Right? But that's one prophetic ideal. The second is for males, a sign, a mark of the male body as a direct sign of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. Right? Don't need to go any further into circumcision. It's super uncomfortable. Okay, but yet, and then we get the third, which is the land to which I will show you, I will give to you. That third prophetic ideal is not revealed within the five books of Moses. 
So some scholars have purported that instead of it being the five books of Moses, perhaps we should look at it as the understanding of the Hexateuch, the sixth book. For at the sixth book, the book of Joshua, is when that becomes revealed, that we go into the land. Now, Darcy, regarding Joshua's lightning conquests, as we know, he goes from the Jordanian side, goes into Canaan, into the city of Ai, then the city of Jericho, and God made it very clear. God said, you shall smite every man, woman, and child. That, and I'll speak for my congregation, I'll speak for my community, that's really difficult to read. However, as a progressive Jew or a reformed Jew, and I don't like using labels, but I think this is important for us to recognize. As a reformed Jew, I take the Torah seriously. I do not take it literally. Okay? I believe the Torah was divinely inspired by God, but was written by human beings. So when we get this lightning conquest of killing, I take the story and, and the narrative seriously. However, it's a story. And I think that that's what it is, is it has to show the projection, the, the trajectory of how the Israelites came from one land and was given into another land promised by God. That it's also a time of war. As they cross over, the Canaanites are poised and ready to fight. They want their land. Well, the Israelites want the land that they're going to inhabit. So it, it's, it's that constant struggle of how do we go into a land that is not ours? Let's make that clear. Okay? The land that is not ours to a land that God promised. We are the only tribe, group of people that still exist. The Canaanites do not exist. The Hittites, the Jebusites, any ites, they don't exist. The Israelites, we go into exile, the Jewish people, we are the only people really in the region within the Middle East that is indigenous to the land. So in response to the question, the book of Joshua, for me, is actually really difficult to read. It is actually painful. Because as a religion that, that, that supports peace by all means, and we are told that when we go into a land and we are poised with war, before we engage in war, we offer an olive branch. We offer terms of peace. The book of Joshua is very challenging because of the loss of life. However, much like the season we're in right now of Passover, there is a midrash that says that when God split the sea and the waters come crashing down, drowning the Egyptians, the angels sing loudly to God. And God says, how dare you? Mm -hmm. You, the angels, sing songs of praise when I, the Lord your God, had to destroy the Egyptians. Your Freedom comes at a price. And in some way, we hear these words of this Midrash of, it's painful. Yeah. And I think it's painful for God. However, I also think that it is a testament of the strength and the importance of what the land represents. And we will return to that. I'm just going to give Father Christian a little, well, put you on the spot too. Well, I got a mic. Jesus was called the Prince of Peace. He called Christians to love their enemies, turn the other cheek when struck, and so on. But within a few centuries of his death, the early Christian fathers had worked out a so-called just war theory. 
which would serve to justify violence if certain criteria were met. Could you explain a bit about this theory, how it has been used? Augustine was the first one to really develop that, and then we saw Aquinas later on who really started to flesh out exactly what is just war theory. But it's really a a giving in to the brokenness of humanity. So there is the idealistic vision that we love to have of following Jesus and living in peace and turning the cheek and loving our enemy. That is that is exactly what Jesus says. You read the Sermon on the Mount. There is, I agree with Darcy. There's no way for you to be able to support violence or hatred um, or killing uh, through the Christian scripture, period. Um, and we live in a very messy, messy place here on earth. Uh, we know from Genesis we live in the chaos. So what do you do when the chaos comes upon you? So the example that's given sometimes, a microcosm of that, is that you, you're in your house and someone breaks into your house and you uh, are, are the father and someone's attacking your wife and kids. Um, what do you do in the name of love? Because that's what Jesus says. Do everything in, in, in the name of love. And that's what scripture teaches us. Well, so is it love to protect your wife and your kids? Which means you might have to kill the attacker. Is that, is that love? Can you, or can you stage a peaceful protest in your house and hopefully the attacker goes away? Now, I know it sounds a little ridiculous, and I will say, I'm going to tell you this, is the, the idealism, we've seen examples of going the way of peace and nonviolence works. It changes the world. Martin Luther King didn't raise one fist and change this country. Not one fist. His other leader that he worked with, Malcolm X, said, by any means possible, that didn't go as far. Nonviolence works. Mahatma Gandhi changed England, changed India through nonviolence. So we know this works. So I'm not giving in to that, and I don't think that we need to cave to just war theory. I think we haven't been enlightened enough of how to really embrace the way of Jesus Christ uh, to um, really believe that peace and nonviolence will win. Uh, I've heard testimonies from people in church who've been in situations under attack. Uh, They have prayed their way through it, and miracles have happened. So I know that can happen. That being said, we still live in a very imperfect place, and the church fathers know that. Uh, And so there's five, uh, they talk about uh, juice ad bellum and and juice in in bello, uh, which is the the criteria you need theologically before you go to battle to make the decision, and then what you do during battle. Um, And so one of them that they would say that Augustine and then, of course, uh, Aquinas later on in the 15th century will come and flesh out more uh, is that you have to have one authority, like a, like a, um, a prominent authority. You can't just have a ragtag group of people says, let's go to war. Uh, you have to have a, a major authority that says, yes, we've, we discern this, we're going to do it. Um, then there has to be proportionality. Is there going to be, so what happened to you that you were attacked that you need to now respond? Is it proportional? Are you going to do that in proportion? Um, is there hope that you can actually win? If there's no hope you're going to win, don't do it. Uh, is it to fight for the innocent life? Uh, that is important. You have to be fighting for the innocents. You can't just go in and just start mowing down people left and right because you want their land or whatever it may be. Um, that there has to be uh, also the right intention. It can't be about belligerence. You can't be going in there because you hate the other people. Uh, you have to go in because you're looking to protect and to fight again. This is the irony of it all. Can love be a part of this war? I'm doing this out of my love. So in World War II, there's a love for we see our Jewish brothers and sisters uh, dying in camps. So out of a love for humanity, we're going to go to war. So that would say that part of World War II, just war theory would say, yes, that was on point. Uh, it was proportional. There was authority. We definitely, the, the states waited a long time to get involved. Uh, we, uh, there was a protection of innocence. Uh, now, then, however, once we got into war, uh, just war theory would say the atomic bomb was not proportional. That just war theory would say that was improportional and caused generations of, of death upon a nation. So that would be not proportional. So uh, if you go by just war theory, not trying to, we're going to start that up for discussion here because I know it's a hot topic. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the church is been saying through the years, the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church has embraced this, and other churches, that we're putting restrictions around war, not trying to rationalize it or make war okay. It does become a necessary evil and one that we hate. 
And as G.K. Jesterson once said, he said, you, you, you go to war because not to love the war, but to hate what you leave behind. You, you, you want to just be done with this. Um, and for you are doing it for a love of, of, of peace. Um, and these are the ways that you do that. And you have to also be able to identify your combatants. Uh, okay. And, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want a little question here. Yeah. You know that the Crusades went on for centuries uh -huh. with the explicit approval of the church. Uh -huh. And it's been estimated that some two to six million people died during that time. Now, how were the Crusades justified? Well, you were, can't they justify it. were they conducted for perfectly religious reasons or no? I mean, if, if my, my take on it, no, it was a complete it land was a complete, grab. You know what show. Um, you, there was many of them that went on. Some of them involved children. Uh, I would say that religion became an excuse mm. that was used by the Pope for power because they were upset because their Muslim neighbors came in, invaded them, took their riches, took their land, and they needed an excuse to rally the troops. And some people did fight it for their faith. Some people, yes, fought for, for, for Christianity. We're going to go free our Christians who were persecuted by the uh, Muslims. They took our treasure. They took our land. But really, it was a land grab. It was a power grab. And it was completely a failure. Um, and it's a stain on Christianity. But I don't really have any true thoughts on this. <laughs> well, you may not have any uh, mature thoughts on what I'm going to ask next, but I'm still going to ask it. Uh, because this is the most egregious to me in a way, was Pope Alexander VI promulgated the Doctrine of Discovery in 1493. It remained in effect for a long, long time. This doctrine of the church allowed European explorers to claim land discovered in the New World for the church and for their European sovereigns, disregarding the fact that the land was already occupied by indigenous people who were often forced to convert to Christianity or else. I, I can't imagine, but do you think this kind of conversion by colonization is what Jesus had in mind when he said in Matthew 28, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I think he would probably say no to that. Correct. Human beings are going to use, we have a history of just using religion a lot um, to marry our pursuits of power, uh, of land, um, and that is, we, we'll, we'll see it even today. Uh, you know, this, this uh, was not officially rebuked. Um, That's right. I, I want to call it uh, Manifest Destiny, not Manifest Destiny. It's, would you, would, doctrine of Discovery. Doctrine of Discovery until 2023. The Vatican didn't finally come out and say this is wrong until 2023. Um, and and, and, and uh, some of us really like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, she used it in support of a case in 2005. Hmm. Uh, it was used in a landmark case in 1823 of our Supreme Court. So it had effects throughout the states, throughout Europe, about why we should be pulling things away from the indigenous. Um, so it had lasting impact upon leaders who we look at who are you know, pretty, pretty sharp. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it has infected in a, a lot of, every country has dealt with how do we deal with the indigenous? It's not just the states, it's Canada, I was out No, Chile. when I say indigenous, I simply mean the native populations exactly. of whatever land the Europeans were conquering. Yeah. And so you could just call it war, and someone lost, and someone won. It stinks, it's horrible, but to use religion for it is what happens to, get to rally the masses and say, no, this is for Christianity. Um, but there's nothing in Scripture that would support that Jesus would say, yeah, that's how we do this. Okay, so I think it's time now to bring things up closer to the present day. The situation in the Middle East has been on everyone's mind ever since our last Lunch and Learn series, which took place just a few days after the day that will live in infamy, October the 7th, a day we'll never forget. Rabbi Matthew, just putting this in a scriptural context and then present day. God commands King Saul in the first book of Samuel to kill every person in Amalek, a rival nation, ancient Israel. This is what the Lord Almighty says, the prophet Samuel tells Saul. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amal Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. In other words, 
God is ordering Saul through the prophet Samuel to treat everything associated with the Amalekites as cherem, doomed to total destruction. Back in November, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, when speaking to the people of Israel, said, you must remember what Amalek has done to you, says our Holy Bible, and we do remember, end quote. I take it he was calling for some sort of complete destruction, presumably of Hamas. Uh, I know you're not a geopolitical strategist or political expert, but I know everybody here would like to know your take on the subject, how your people are feeling. So could you please address that? You know, when we look at the, at the uh, Amalekites, for example, their descendantry comes from uh, the children of Esau. Okay? And, and, and for the Amalekites, there's always been that tremendous tension between the two peoples, between the Israelites and the Amalekites. That, that phrase coming out of the out of our tradition, certainly out of prophets, is, is, is much like the same like we just discussed a little bit earlier. It is very distressing to hear God talk in such language that is not supporting terms of peace, right? God doesn't say, go into the land, see what they're up to. At the end of the day, offer terms of peace. And if they don't, then okay, you know, you got my blessing. But it's even more upsetting to hear Benjamin Yes, uh, and to speak in, in that regard, um, and I just want to make it clear in terms of, and I say this to my congregation as well, I may not always agree with the policies or the tactics that Israel or the government takes, but I will always support Israel. Right. Um, the comment revealed by the Prime Minister made my heart sink. And a part of me said, what you're doing is you're equating something in 2024 in 2023, with something that happened three millennia ago, 3,000 years ago, it's not the same. It's not the same. And I think we have to remember that when you look in an organization like Hamas, their main objective, and there is no ambiguity here, I mean, it's in their charter, is to wipe Israel off the face of the map. Right? As opposed to Israeli Arabs, Israeli Palestinians, who are living inside the land. And let me make it clear, there have also been Israeli Palestinians who fight for the state of Israel. They are in the IDF. So, you know, when we look at that, at that statement of go in and smite every man, woman, and child, I think we have to take it in, in some degree forgive the expression given the Middle East, but with a grain of salt from the Dead Sea. You gotta take it with a small grain of salt. But the message is clear. And yet, at the same time, the Bible, as I'm sure many of us are aware of, the Bible is interpretive. We interpret it in a million different ways. Mm. And I think the interpretation, really what the message is trying to say is, this is a land to which I'm gonna give you. Occupy it, secure it, and have your offspring, right? What, what becomes important, I think, is the general understanding of why wars are fought. Why is war fought? War is fought for two premises, land and water, okay? So you may have heard, as I'm sure many of us have heard, right? There are some calls mm -hmm. to the Israelis, to Israel, that they want pre-67 borders. Why? Pre-67, they had the Sea of Galilee in the north. It's the only fresh water in the area. So when you look at Syria, for example, why do they keep pressing pre-67? Because if they were to go pre-67, they own um, the only fresh water source in Israel, They'll cut it off, and Israel will have no fresh water. I don't know if we're familiar with the story of Ellie Cohen, the spy. If we're not, I'll give you a very brief synopsis. This is quite fascinating. Ellie Cohen was born in Alexandria in Egypt. All his life, he wanted to work for Mossad, 
or the intelligence agency in Israel, and he was turned down many times. He speaks, he spoke something like four different languages, Arabic, Hebrew, I mean, he spoke it all. So he was contracted by Mossad, and he became a spy. He told his wife that he was working for international commerce with the state of Israel. So he would be in Western Europe, and he'd be all over the place supporting and raising funds for Israel. He was in South America, in Argentina, getting close with some of the Syrians, and he would travel between South America, Argentina, and Damascus, and he would spy and give information back to Israel. In 1965, which was the day, which was the year he died, he was standing on what we call the Golan Heights in the north of Israel, right by the Sea of Galilee. And he was saying to some Syrian officials, you know, and anyone that's been to Israel in the summer, it ain't pleasant. It's hot. So he says, you know what would be amazing? Why don't you build some eucalyptus trees so your soldiers can have some shade? Soldiers said, what an amazing idea. So they built eucalyptus trees on the ridge. And Ellie Cohen, and forgive the expression, is laughing all the way to the bank. Why? I can see you now. I know where you are. Okay? That happened. And then in 1965, Ellie Cohen was transmitting messages back to the state of Israel and was found by the Syrians. And he was not tried for espionage. He was killed. And as the Israelis and many other Western countries had pleaded with the Syrian government to please not execute, not only did they execute him publicly, mm. they broadcast it on TV. It was the first time his wife knew what, his, what her husband had done. Two years later, Israel grants for itself the Golan Heights. Water is such a precious resource that most of the world's wars are fought because of water. Acquisition of land, so many empires. You look at the Romans, you look at the Greeks, you look at the Ottomans, it was about acquisition of land so that we could show our prowess and how much territory we could gain. Because if you look at it from a today's perspective, remember today's understanding of the state of Israel, which is the size of the state of New Jersey, or in a European context, the country of Wales, that is not the same as what Biblical Israel was. Biblical Israel was Lebanon, was Syria, was Jordan, was Saudi Arabia, was Egypt. It's a massive region. It's only because of the French and the British who carved up the Middle East after World War I to start bringing in borders and areas to define the Middle East. Right? So if you think of it from that perspective, Israel itself was much larger of an entity than it is today. And I think when we go back to the pitfalls and the evils of war, it's about acquisition. It's about acquisition and it's about territory, land, and water for survival. Exactly. Survival. And I think that rings a bell with anybody. That's our human nature. Sheikh, would you like to approach that from a Muslim point of view? What is going on, sadly? Uh, I know, as Rabbi said, this, <laughs> this is a hard question, right? Um, you know, as most of you know me in the past few years, I, I, I am very, very, um, very interfaith. I, I like to think very, um, very, very, what would I say? You know, I, I, I like to make a political joke. I always tell people, I think like a Republican, but I got a heart of a Democrat. <laughs> Meaning, I like to think very global, very national, very local, very beneficial for everybody. 
And uh, from an interfaith point of view, I will respond on this as an interfaith community leader. That, you know, as Rabbi and, and, and Father said, it's, it's all about a human ego. People, religious leaders, whether it's on the Jewish side or the Muslim side or the Christian side and the past and the history and the Crusaders and whoever it may be, it's all about people using the scripture for their own ego. In the name of God, they use that to fight. In the name of God, sometimes they may go in with a good intention, but at the end of the day, they come out with bad action. You know, it might be for the, for, for, you know, for in the name of faith, in the name of guiding people on the right path. And this is, um, you know, that, that's why, you know, I have never, I, I, I have publicly said it in my sermons, Darcy, I've publicly said it, I don't support the activities and the actions of people like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like Al-Qaeda, like the ISIS, I've publicly said that. And to let you know, I've had many threats by some of these people international, many threats, because they look at me as a very modern liberal but I, I i look at this from a quranic point of view from a scripture point of view mm. even from the jewish and the christian point of view whatever wars went on it's not about god it's about men who have used and misused the scripture and it happens still today for their own political gain and um, what is going on in the middle east i mean this could have been solved but the mere fact that you see some countries involved and some countries not involved is because there are some gray areas. That's why people are scared to get very clear. You, you know what I'm saying? We all agree what, um, and I, I mean, I, I want to say this, we agree what um, Hamas has done is totally wrong. I have a lot of Muslims who come to me and say, why are you not always talking pro-Palestine? I say, well, it's not that I don't support pro-Palestine. I support all human beings worldwide. Yes, what Hamas has done is wrong. And um, yes, what Netanyahu has done as a prime minister in trying to get rid of Hamas, killing a bunch of innocent people, 30,000, that should not have been the methodology. I don't think that's good science. That's not good technology. That's not good intelligence. That's not, I mean, you have to be clever in today's time. And I suppose that's what Rabbi was trying to say that yes, you have to get rid of, of those who do wrong, but you have to try your best not to harm innocent people in that process. Everybody does that. You're in a church, you're in a job, you got workers, you got co-workers, you got to solve a problem. Sometimes it involves all the workers, but you have to try to get those who are bad out without hurting those who are innocent. And that's where intelligence and intellectualism comes, and that's where having the art of leadership comes. So. Uh, in conclusion, I totally don't support radicalism and extremism, uh, being extreme and all this kind of extremism that takes place in the world, uh, because we're in a very modern day. We're not in a day that, that, that you have to go back to those days and fight like primitive, uncivilized people. We're in a very technological world, intellectual world, where you can use a lot of intelligence to solve problems. You know, last week I was mentioning, I mean, I grew up in the days when, and a lot of, I mean, in America, no, but if you go back in the many years all over the world, children were scolded by being beaten. I grew up in a British school. I had a British teacher who used to smack you when you do something wrong and you don't know your work. But with the corporal law and the time, times have changed. People start using intelligence and being smarter. You, you see what I'm saying? Those were the wrong, the, I'm not saying that was right, that was totally wrong. If you even check in Islam, mm. go read it. The prophet, peace be upon him, never smack any children. He never believed in hitting. So those days people used all these unnecessary wars and fights and kill. Maybe that was their time. I don't need to get into that. But I'm saying we're in a different world. We should not be seeing what we see now, whether it's Ukraine whether it's Russia, whether it's Iran. Listen, many of these countries got their own political agenda. Whether it be Hamas, whether it be Iran, whether it be ISIS, whether it's Hezbollah. I, I emphatically make these points very clear. And the, the fight for land and power has nothing to do with God. Has nothing to do with the scripture. It's people use religion in the name of God, in the name of religion, to also get this, these books and this power on their side. That's a man-ego thing. It's nothing about God. And, and, and as you opened up your, 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 your opening remarks today, Abrahamic faiths and no other faiths um, would have been responsible for wars. A lot of people say that. 
that religion is responsible for more wars. No, people of religion is responsible for wars, not the scripture. It's people who have hijacked the religion and they use that in a very sarcastic way to get their whims and fancies over. Thank you very much. I will just... Uh, <laughs> I want to admit that Israel is in a particularly tricky position because Hamas has sworn, it's not just from the river to the sea land, it's to be, to wipe out every Jew in the land, it's to be free of Jews. And they have hidden themselves in such a way that it's very difficult to wage war on them. And they represent an existential threat to the state of Israel, which is the only place that you have historically felt secure. So I, it's a terrible tension, it's a terrible moment. And you know, I, I need to share something as you mentioned that, and this you may not hear from many Muslims out there, but there are Muslims who share this because this is it. The real perspective of the Quranic concept is that Muslims, Christians, and Jews need to live together. The people of the book. We are the people of the book. We are not a similar people. We came from Abraham. We are bloodline. We, you go and check our DNA. We came from Abraham. The wives may be different, but the bloodline mm -hmm. is the same. The land there belongs to the forefathers and the family and everyone put together. They need to find a solution how to live together. That's my point. It's nothing about being good and good neighbors and good religion. They're one family. And the true Islamic and the Quranic perspective, you may hear some other Muslims saying otherwise, but they're wrong. The Quran tells us that Esau and Jacob and Joseph, Joseph is considered one of the holiest prophets in the Quran. Jacob, everybody, we, are, we believe, we follow our lifestyle by Jacob and Joseph and Esau and Moses and, and David and Solomon. And Jesus. And Jesus, peace be upon them. We, if we don't believe in them, and we speak against them, we are not Muslims. So the real bottom line of Jerusalem, and if you go there, as you see, it's one building, one entrance for the Muslims, one entrance the church, one entrance the synagogue, I've been there. It's one people, one land. You know, in America, we say one people, one under one God, one nation. That's where we, there and here, we should be doing the same thing. But what, what is surprising, the very same Muslims and Jews and Christians who fight in the Middle East, they come in America and say one nation, one God, under one God, one nation. We live together here. We live in peace here. And where we should also be living in peace, we make war. That is so sad. That's the holy land where that peace came from. You, you follow the point I'm getting at? You go now and you will see living proof. Actually, that's the reason for the fight. Everybody thinks it belongs to them, but they cannot find a justified and peaceful way how to live together in harmony. And that's what we have to aim at. And I think programs like this and education like this can bring people to that understanding. Absolutely. <clears throat> just, um, just, <coughs> just, a, just a point of clarification as well. I mean, if we look back into Western religion, for example, um, the world's first land claim, do we know what the world's first land claim is? Abraham purchased the cave of Machpelah. That's right. All right? And if we remember the story, Abraham sees this cave, the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. He sees Ephron the Hittite, and Ephron says, no, 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 don't worry about it, buddy. Just take it. Just take it. And Abraham pleads and says, no, I will give you 400 shekels of silver. I can't even express to you what 400 of shekels of silver was 4,000 years ago. It's a tremendous amount of money. And, but yet he gives him his wealth so that he can have this cave to bury Sarah. Hmm. And subsequently, the rest of our matriarchs and our patriarchs. The cave of Machpelah today, it's not in the state of Israel. It's in the West Bank. It's Hebron. Israel... And it's, it's one of those challenges that, um, you know, I oftentimes go back with, with my family and with my wife. Of, you know, I lived in Israel for 15 months. I mean, I love Israel. It's the one city I never got to because it wasn't safe. Mm. I would have to go on a tour flanked with Israeli IDF soldiers to be able to go see this cave. 
It's the world's first land claim. And in some way, and, and I agree with you, Shay, because I think that there is something there too, is that religion does not cause war. People who take scripture out of context, use it for their own personal devices, and become so strong and narrow-minded that they think it's about them. And I think if we took our scriptures in some way and tempered them with our own idea, with our own interpretation, the world may be a little bit different. Or you may be Anglican. <laughs> it's a three-legged stool. Right. Tradition, scripture, reason. It's funny you say that because you went we to an say, Anglican high school. We, we say God, Torah, and Israel, although we do not talk Trinity. But God, Torah, and the Israel. The Jewish Trinity, you heard it here first. <laughs> See, we're already starting to connect. <laughs> I'm going to sort of wrap this uh, baby up. Uh, in conclusion, I think we can indeed say that a great deal of blood has been shed and wars fought, often using religion as a pretext or a justification for what might be considered less noble purposes. But there's more than a grain of truth in this myth that the Abrahamic faiths have a lot to answer for. But I would contend, just as all the gentlemen have been saying, what we need is a genuine return to the original tenets of our faiths. I say this because, as all of you have underlined, each of the faiths has much more to say about love, compassion, and peace than they do about war, if we would only abide by those teachings. And I also say this because if you look at the 20th century alone, over 110 million people were put to death in war, and not a single one in the name of religion or God. That kind of carnage, which dwarfs that of the Crusades and the conquests of Muhammad, was inflicted by three totalitarian regimes. That of Adolf Hitler, who was responsible for the killing of at least six million Jews, plus many others, Joseph Stalin, and the king of them all, Mao Zedong. None motivated by religious fervor. It's when people free themselves from any accountability to God that the very worst atrocities are committed, and on a scale never before seen. It was the French novelist and intellectual André Malraux who said, the 21st century will be religious or it won't be. I think he was making a very serious point. I thank you for your patience today, for your attention, and I really ask you, if you would, to take down my email, send me your questions for next week, or there won't be a next week. <laughs> <laughs> You want to end with prayer, please. Go ahead, Father Christian. All right, let's pray, friends. God in heaven, and you've called us here on earth to um, be in this, at times, very chaotic place, but um, we see the glimmers of faith and hope in all of us uh, as because we are all your children. Mm -hmm. And so we have quite the mission in front of us, and we can only do it um, with the, this piece of of your heaven here on earth that you've, you've bestowed upon us. And so just in this building here, we, we have your children of Abraham, Muslims, Jews, Christians, which on a broader scale should be at war. Um, there should be tension. Uh, but we have, we're led by holy curiosity in one another. We're not interested in putting God in the real estate business. We're not interested in God deciding which tribe is better. Um, we're just interested in you and one another because we're all your children. Help us, God, that the more that we can find love within our so-called enemy, the more we can find love of you. And um, give us the strength and the spirit to do that. Guide us in the programs that we do, but guide us in our, just our daily walk. 
Help us to submit to you, to love you, um, the God of all, of all children. Mm. And it's uh, you who we follow. So thank you. We love you. And keep on working through us and leading us to do the work you've called us to do here as your children. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Shalom. <laughs>